Tanzania, land of wild animals, Kilimanjaro and Zanzibar. Javed, the photographer, will take us to discover his island, Zanzibar. In this Tanzanian archipelago that combines the colors of Africa and the Orient, music and the heady fragrance of spices blend into the sea. Tanzania is also a great jungle book. Pascal the guide will take us on a trip through a wild world that is like something from the dawn of humanity. Kilimanjaro, the highest summit in Africa, in the middle of the land of the Washaga people. Simon the marathon runner holds the record for the ascent and descent of Kilimanjaro. This mountain is his whole life. Today, we benefit greatly of this mountain. This is not only the Wachaga people, this is a, a treasure for my country. We approach the eastern coast of Africa by the Indian Ocean, Zanzibar a mythical name, an archipelago of nearly 75 islands that was united to nearby Tanzania in the 1960s. Only some 15 of the islands are inhabited. Zanzibar is an important port of call on sea routes. The main island is called Unguja. For a long time, it had a reputation as an important and flourishing trading post a port from which the famous Dows set sail for far-off destinations. Javed is a photographer. We could even say he is the photographer of Zanzibar. His family came from India and settled here more than a century ago. For the last 15 years or so, Javed has been photographing life on the archipelago. He now has a collection of more than 50,000 photos. To show his work, Javed started his own publishing house and bookshop in Stone Town, the main town on the island. He publishes, on the average, three books of photos a year. These books, dealing with the history and culture of his country, have been translated into many languages. This may sound like a success story, but it was necessity, not choice, that led Javed down this path. After repeated refusals of his work, he decided to take his future into his own hands. When I did my photography in UK, I had approached almost all the publishers in Europe and says, look, uh, I've just finished and I'm going to Zanzibar and I want to do a book on Zanzibar. Everyone said, sorry, there's no market for Zanzibar. There is no commercial market. Zanzibar is too small. I mean, we do books where it would sell millions or at least 5,000, 10,000. I'd approach every big publishers. I'm talking about 93, 92, 94. Everyone said Zanzibar is not our market. So I said, well, if no one else wants to do it, I'm going to do it. <laughs> Javed also launched a regular magazine on life in Zanzibar. He gets to see local life from a privileged point of view, so he invited us to come along with him as he works. It's a rather eclectic program, but fascinating to watch. That's the one which is going to go into that. Okay, so you're still following it up, eh? All right, okay. This one morning, Javed started out by looking up into the air. He wanted to photograph the first colors of what to us looked like simple buds. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. This is the king crop of Zanzibar. Zanzibar has always depended on gloves. During 60s and 70s, Zanzibar was used to earn export earnings on this. However, now tourism is taking more, uh, bringing more revenue in terms of cloves. Clove trees, when it's in season, 
you can smell cloves. Everywhere you go, you smell cloves, you see cloves. All the village people, everyone, they're walking on the cloves. In the evening, they come and take all the, uh, the cloves out from the tree. Next day, they put it on the floor and they dry it. So it takes three days, four days, five days. This is Zanzibar nutmeg and mace. And in Zanzibar, they make uh, the powder of this. And they, for the wedding night, they always give it to bride. So she gets a bit of a uh, high. And this is the secret of Zanzibar wedding. If there's no nutmeg and mace, uh, there's no wedding in Zanzibar. Uh, yes, smell of Zanzibar. The smell of Zanzibar wedding. <laughs> the name Zanzibar is, of course, closely associated with the spice trade. Cardamom, pepper, nutmeg, cinnamon, cumin, cloves, all these spices contributed to the wealth and reputation of this island. Many merchants settled here, bringing with them their cultures and their traditions. Zanzibar, a blend of colors, of smells, but also of ethnic groups and civilizations. But the history of Zanzibar also has its somber side. For a long time, the archipelago's fortune was also built on the slave trade. Up to 50,000 human beings passed through the docks of Stone Town every year. They were sold here before being transported to other countries. Even after slavery was abolished, the traffic continued in clandestine places here, and the slave trade went on until after the end of the First World War. This woman is undoubtedly one of the last survivors of that tragic era. B. Kidude is 98 today, or 105. She doesn't really know herself. But B. Kidude is not just the memory of a bygone age. She is above all a voice, a respected, even admired voice in Zanzibar. Javed has just finished a book about her, and like any artist, she signs her name to it, written in Arabic. It's the only word she knows how to write, the only word she knows how to read. Nobody ever taught me how to sing. I started when I was 10 and have been singing ever since. That's right, I learned how to sing in the Arab Dao's. Do I still sing? Of course I do. How would I eat if I didn't sing? I'd live on thin air? You're kidding. Then Javed takes us to see, and more importantly to hear, an all-female orchestra. Women who take up music and play under a man's direction, this may sound normal, but here, it's a great step forward. In this country, with its double Arabic-African influence, women's freedom is not always encouraged. The creation of this musical ensemble is a first that Javed didn't want to miss. You know, there are some people who, who do not allow their children or their daughters or their wives to, 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 to perform with men, you know, men, men and women group. But they, are, they, they allow them to, have, to, to, to participate in women groups. So I think it's going to be an interesting, you know, very interesting, to bring back these uh, women groups whereby you find... Because there are women who are very talented. 
Well, these women started uh, to play the music almost two and a half, two and a half months, not years. Nobody can believe about this. And it will be a, a, for them a, a new thing. And Usually one starts, others start complaining, say, why women, and, and then, but then later, all of them support. This is how life is. <laughs> The sound of the Tarab music with its multiple influences is still ringing in our ears and already Javed is sweeping us off to another destination, Uzi Island. On this rather forgotten island, the inhabitants are somewhat wary of our approach and tend to avoid us, at first. The reason that Javed has come here is simple. He wants to photograph the mangrove forest, which after a period of regression has once again started to grow. These young shoots he is photographing are a true symbol of regeneration. Very nice. This mangrove is uh, lost. I think it's just a new, new life has just grown over here. Very interesting. I like it. Coming around a bend in the mangrove, we're greeted by one of the locals. In the beginning, Fazin was self-appointed guardian of the mangrove, but now the authorities have made his position official. He looks after the proper development of this fragile environment that is indispensable to the balance between so many species. In Zanzibar, only now two villages, uh -huh. big mangrove like this. Uh -huh. Here, Uzi, uh -huh. and uh, we call it Chwaka. Uh, Chwaka, okay. Yes. Okay. So here, we just uh, we, we prepared or uh -huh. we protect. Uh -huh. Any person don't come to cut it. When they cut the mangroves, what do they use the mangroves They for? use for charcoals. Ah, uh, okay. So charcoals only. Only charcoals. And charcoals, and to how to, if you want to go now to build a house, you can just uh, for, for put a tin on. For the uh, house. Boriti, Boriti. Boriti, yes. Okay, so Sasabi, in Uzi Island, you do not allow them to cut. Yes, there are this. If you cut this, we go now at the police station, and police come and mangrove has be called mangrove uh -huh. to protect. Uh, big, to we say the bath, we, the fish is small. Big fish uh -huh. come inside and okay. bath here. So the, all the big fish, yes. they come here. Yes. And they give birth to babies. Yes. And they live here. Yes. Before they go out. Yes. When the high tide, they move. Okay, so if we cut the mangroves, we have no fish. Yes, no fish. If there's no fish, no fishermen. Yeah, no fishermen. And that means we're all in trouble. Yes. Which is the same, same species? This is the same type. This and this. Okay. this, and this. So, so, so there are six species you said, eh? Five. 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 Five types of mangroves. Oh, found on Ozi Island. This is the seed of this type. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. So when you want to, they remove the gun like this, and this become how to grow. It grow itself. Don't come person to grow. It grow with itself. Yes. But preserving the mangrove forest without maintaining the activities of the population is pointless. So for all parties to live in harmony, they have to try to develop alternative small-scale activities. So this uh, project of honey bee, uh -huh. how to prepare the, the, the bee, the honey. Uh -huh. So we call the, this project of special for ladies of the uh -huh. village uh -huh. to prepare the, uh, to take honey. And how honey then they sold. How many do you have this now? This how many types? Uh, more than 20 there's inside. So this is called very nice honey for flowers of mangroves. Okay. But I, they, normally they, they settle three months or four months, they come to, to take off. Uh -huh. uh. Back on the main island of Unguja, Javed, always on the move, takes us to Nungui, the boat builder's village. 
This is where the famous boats are built, the dhows, that made the seafaring reputation of Zanzibar. Today, Javed has come to see the boat he is having built. He plans to sail through the whole archipelago, exploring the lesser-known nooks and crannies of the different islands and capturing the light and the landscapes he feels so strongly about. The people of Nungui uh, have been building uh, the dhows for almost years, centuries. And this is the very famous place, all the master uh, dao men uh, from Nungui. And uh, Nungui is renowned for making dhows for a lot of... Uh, and, it, and the traditions are passed from father to son, father to son. This is how people have learned. So basically, Nungui is the dao capital of the world, I would say. I would say dao capital of Zanzibar. Uh, and I think that's the way it is. It takes about three months to make a boat and it involves a lot of people. So you're looking at about seven, eight people working on for three months by the time the boat is finished. So it's a long, tedious work and everything is done by hand. It's a labor of love. Without blueprints, using only the eye's precision and a great deal of skill, these men build vessels that can face the whims and tantrums of the Indian Ocean and link the islands of the archipelago. Even if times have changed and Zanzibar has lost its prestige and its fame, Javed still looks upon these islands with the eyes of his passion and continues to capture with his cameras all the natural and human beauty of this land that he loves. Pascal is a retired professor of natural history. Animals, animals, animals everywhere. This nature lover knows how to read and interpret the local wildlife like an open book. At present, he volunteers his time to do observation missions for Tanzania's national parks. Discovering with him the Tarangere National Park, one of the country's lesser known parks, is quite a treat, spiced up by his enthusiasm for this incredible wildlife refuge, one of the planet's privileged sanctuaries. Pascal got a special permission to leave the main trails to get a closer look at the wildlife. For Pascal, just being in the presence of the animals and observing them is an endless source of wonder. I love nature, I love animals, I love the natural environment. I grew up uh, as a young boy in the village and I used to, we used to do a, lot of, a bit of hunting. And um, so I got used to, uh, to, 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 to wild animals, to birds, to plants and vegetation and natural environment. And then later on as I grew up, I was trained as a naturalist and um, a wildlife manager. The Tarangire Park contains the highest population density of elephants in the world. They are attracted to a marshy zone here and to the Tarangire River, a permanent source of water that gave its name to the park. This zone, the swamp as it is called here, attracts more than elephants. A multitude of species share this space, and large colonies of migratory birds come to winter here every year. Among all the species that live here, Pascal has a particular fondness for the elephants. He can spend hours observing their behavior and their movements. You know, they walk in a kind of an extended, uh, extended line. Uh, if you look at it, you'll see that you have the, the mothers, 
you know, leading the way, and then they have the, you know, the babies in between, and then you have some behind. Just make sure that uh, the babies are well protected, and they're coming to graze now in the swamp, and to drink too. Here, the animals live together and share their territory where each one has its own niche. The animals roam free and the humans stay in their four-wheel drive vehicles. There is real danger. This is not a zoo. The natural behavior of the animals must not be disturbed. The trunk has a lot of, so many functions. Uh, for breathing, for, you know, uh, for drinking, it, it sucks in water pumps it in the mouth, yeah, and, and for smelling, you know, for fighting, you know, for love making, you know, caressing, it uses the same trunk, yeah. When they're born, they weigh about 100 to 120 kilograms. They grow very quickly when they're young, and then uh, when they start getting to at the age of five, six, they grow now slowly. After their migration to different watering holes, the elephants regroup into smaller family units. The young, in training, are learning to use their trunks like a baby its thumb. Elephants are very protective animals. You're best off listening to Pascal's advice and not get too close to them. End of the first day of our special elephant safari. But on the way back, nature treats us to yet another wonderful sight. Like at the beginning of time, animals still live here with their own rules in total harmony. The next day, Pascal tracks down a herd of buffalo. All of a sudden, we are the ones being observed. Buffalo are one of the big five. That is the five most dangerous species of African wildlife. These are social animals that live in a big head. They are fairly dangerous. They have killed a lot of hunters. Hunters who thought they are just like cows, but in fact they are not. They are very, uh, uh, they are very cruel, and uh, if you come very close to their babies. <laughs> These animals, there are times when they lose their temper. You know, for example, if they've been wounded by a, bu by a bullet, and they are solitary, they are hiding somewhere, mm. don't get very close to them. You know, when they're having their afternoon siesta, or just a nap, they are resting, and they are solitary. Don't disturb them. If you do, they can be very wild. These are animals that can change their moods, like sometimes women can change moods too. <laughs> The proximity of water in the Tarangire attracts a large number of animals, and sometimes a big cat perched in a tree watches its prey with a lazy, unconcerned eye. Without Pascal's trained eye, we certainly wouldn't have spotted this leopard hidden up in the branches. He appears almost shy, but all his senses are alert. Then suddenly he feels that his territory is being invaded.
I enjoy just being in the wild. It is interesting to visit, you know, to see these animals in their natural environment. Um, they have different behaviors, different activities that they do, and it gives me a lot of spiritual satisfaction and um, um, recreation to some extent. And so I really enjoy, I, I don't mind being out in the bush for, for, for two months. I'm just very happy. Somewhat apart from other species in the Tarangire Park, large groups of lions enjoy this vast hunting ground, abounding and easy to catch prey. Lions are very common here in Tarangire, and uh, as you can see in this river, where they have just killed a, a fresh zebra, and they love the, the, they love the zebra meat. The females are, are quick and fast, and they, uh, and they normally hunt as a team. So here, six of them have managed to hunt this zebra, and uh, they are now feeding on it. Yeah, look, look over there. A hunt begins before our very eyes. But this time, the zebra is too fast. Usually these, you know, these animals, um, although they are social, but when it comes to table manners, I think they have the poorest of it. Because even if there's plenty of food here, they still scramble for food. And sometimes, even if there are cubs here, they, they will eat first and the cubs will eat later. During the lion's lunch hour, some unexpected visitors burst in on the scene. A strange vehicle with a rake antenna, an odd tool to bring to the feline's feast. Quick introductions are made and we learn that these people are scientists who are tracking and counting the different prides of lions. Yeah, we have about uh, six radio callers that help us to follow the population trend and also we collect range use pattern. We are estimating that the ecosystem has about 400 to 500 lions, the entire ecosystem, Tarangiri and the surrounding areas. They are, they are decreasing actually. Because of the human lion conflicts, the retaliatory killing from the pastoralists surrounding Tarangiri National Park and also the hunting activities. Others are also waiting for their share of the food. The vultures are the park's garbage disposal crew. You know, these are carrion eaters. And the reason why they're here is because they have spotted these lions eating this zebra meat here. So they are hanging around, you know, just waiting for the lions to go so that they can come close and feed on the leftovers. These birds are so important in the ecosystem because, you know, they're the ones who cleans up everything. Otherwise, the whole area would have been smelling, you know, awfully. Pascal is curious about everything. He knows this territory like the back of his hand, and he wanted to show us another animal, an animal one encounters sometimes here, a strange, even improbable creation of nature. That is one of the largest monitor lizards around here, which has a total length of about two and a half meters. And uh, they are here because they feed, there is enough food for them, they feed on catfish. There are a lot of catfish in this swamp. Yeah, the lizard is there. It was trying to climb a tree, I think, to go and check if it could, it, it, could, it can get some eggs of some, uh, of some birds, because it also feeds on eggs. Those are what are called uh, Maasai giraffe. 
and there are quite many in Tarangire. They're quite many, you know, moving around and feeding on the acacia leaves. You know, they are kind of prehistoric animals that uh, you know still exist on Earth today. They don't have many predators because of their, they've got very powerful eyesight and they're fairly big. Because of their big size, uh, the lions are the only predator that can kill you know, the giraffe. And they wait until when they're drinking and uh, uh, they're bending their, their, their neck, then it is easy for them to ambush. For Pascal, contemplating this sanctuary of nature means more than simply observing the animals. It evokes a particular train of thought. I, I'm never bored with seeing these animals. I love coming to see these animals because they are quite interesting. You know, they, you know, they are very refreshing. You know, they are beautiful to see. And uh, every time I come here, it keeps my mind fairly cool. And uh, so I have what you call peace of mind, you know, when I'm out. And that makes life really good. White Mountain, Mountain of Splendor, House of God. For the peoples of the Kilimanjaro, Africa's highest mountain has different names, different faces. Mount Kibo, almost 6,000 meters high, is the highest of the three peaks that make up Kilimanjaro. It is the true symbol of the whole mountain. Simon Mtui is a child of the Washaga tribe, and this mountain has given him everything. He was 16 years old when he first climbed to the summit of Kilimanjaro, his mountain. This is a beautiful mountain. It has been my livelihood for 20 plus years of uh, climbing this mountain and making my progress of life. It's, it remain uh, symbolic for Wachaga. It's a, it's a hidden place. It's a, it's a mountain of God. And uh, when you get the punishment there from the cold, um, you have to believe it's, it's a mountain that nothing exists there. For the Washaga, this place is home to the spirits and their god, Rua, who can bring the rains and ward off bad weather. In funeral ceremonies, the dead are buried facing Mount Kibo. And yet, according to their beliefs, this is not the original cradle of the Washaga people. On the other side of the mountain, more the south, southeast, there's a small mountain called uh, the Kifunika. This Kifunika is the um, it's a mountain where the Chaga people believe that's where the origins of Wachaga. Uh, we go there from our worship, and, and this mountain has uh, so many uh, places where Wachaga people uh, do their sacrifices. But now, a persistent question dogs the mind of Simon and the other Wachaga. What is the future of Mount Kibo and its glacier? Scientists believe that the glacier will have completely disappeared sometime between 2020 and 2025. 
When I was a child, at the age of, um, of 16, when I summit the mountain the first time, uh, basically the glacier were way, way down halfway to the mountain. And uh, this glacier now, they are not longer existing. You can just see a little spatch of, uh, of the glaciers there, but it is almost gone. Uh, we need more scientific proof to understanding what is really going on on this mountain. I feel sad. I feel like this is something that I would like my, my son or my children to come and see, uh, to see these uh, amazing glaciers. And uh, when I visualize what I've seen, when I see what I've saw on the past, uh, I, don't, it, it, I feel imbalanced. I feel like something is missing. Simon, a native son of this land, is an enthusiastic runner, or more precisely, he's a professional marathon man. In 2006, he did the ascent and descent of Kilimanjaro in the amazing time of nine hours and 21 minutes. Every year, Simon takes part in a number of international events, especially in different states in North America, where he is ranked among the best in endurance runs and ultramarathons. Simon trains almost every day here in the hills around Kilimanjaro, right where he was born. This tiny woman with the heavy load on her head is Simon's mother. She's 68. Like all the Washaga, she works every day on the family farm where they raise livestock. She's somewhat less enthusiastic about her son's activity. Okay, I'm going to go. Huh? I'm going to go. I say too much running. I say it's too much running, it's, it's, uh, it's okay. For, uh, but then the mountain, now come the money. What you for? He says it's uh, not a very good place to go. He says uh, Kifoni is like a death, death zone, it's not a very good place to go. Here in the family hut is where Simon was born, along with his nine brothers and sisters. His family is always very surprised each time they see him returning home from the United States. But for Simon, the pull of his mountain is stronger than anything else. I, I'm very happy here to, uh, to live my life in the village. And I, I go every year for running and I come back here. And my mother, she was very happy when I say to her, I go to America and I come back. And I go and come back. So if, even uh, with my first time attempting to get a visa, it was very difficult to, because, for example, in American embassy, they have to ask you this question, what will make you to come back home? I say to them, um, my family. They say, what, what are you saying? I say, it's my family. Uh, so I come back for this. <laughs> Uh, there's a good things on this country. Everything is possible here, and much easier than than in US. You walk and you pay the bills. You walk, you pay the bills. Of course, you do the same here, but it's a different mentality. Simon's father, a giant, almost two meters tall, he's 85 and in fine health. He too still continues looking after his farm. But his real passion is raising short-legged chickens, as he calls them. They lay the best eggs in the village, or so he claims. See, this is the mother of all the chicken with the short legs. Ngo msasi, ndo isalisha hiyo. Msasi. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Freedom, I feel uh, woo, I feel like uh, there's nothing after this. My heart, my body, I feel refreshed after run. I like this every day, I do it. Simon's garden is his pride and joy. He grows his own vegetables, 100% organic. No fertilizer, no chemicals. He uses only his own compost. My father, he didn't know how to read or to write. So he teaches us how to, to grow maize, how to grow coffee, how to work hard. And uh, I think I take this forward uh, from my grandfather to my father. And today I want my son to enjoy the same thing. Like all the Washaga, who are excellent farmers, he grows taro, bananas, rhubarb, some flowers, and his own coffee, 600 to 800 kilos a year. If I wish to do um, 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 more commercial, I will spray a chemical, but I don't do it. It's just let the nature uh, live itself. And that's not all he has to be proud of. Simon grows what are very exotic fruits for this region, strawberries, that he serves up to the travelers in his rural guest house that he has set up. The guests are mostly Americans. I think there is a reason for the clients to come to the village. There's a reason for the clients to come to, um, to enjoy the culture, to talk to the people, to see the, the people of Wachaga and uh, not only to be with them on the mountain, also to learn how their livelihood, besides going on the mountain, besides uh, going on the safari. So I make sure the, the clients come here, they get the richness of this country. When he started to get a reputation in the United States, thanks to the marathons and endurance runs, Simon developed a network of relations. He receives his clients, Kilimanjaro climbing enthusiasts, in his rural guest house. Um, now, um, I want to make sure that everyone is aware of what you're going to go through. Uh, the climb is, a, is, not a, is not a joke, it's not a walkabout, it's a, it's a mountain that you're going to climb. So you have to be uh, very aware of what is going to go uh, on with yourself. We know for sure, the summit is not what brought you here, this experience. We want you to have a full of experience, uh, experience that you wish to come here for. I actually heard about Simon when I was on the top of a mountain in Colorado. Um, someone who knew Simon from the distance running um, told me about him and gave me, wrote down the website, and that's how I found it. I discovered about three years ago that I really liked climbing mountains, and I'm, I'm kind of good at it, and so I wanted to come here and, and climb Kilimanjaro and see Africa as well. You need to make sure you're drinking, uh, you're eating enough. You need to make sure you're, uh, you're sleeping enough. You need to make sure you're warm enough. And that when you arrive to the camp today, they're going to measure the vital sign again. What they're looking for is your O2 sat, your oxygen saturation, how much oxygen you carry in your body. Secondly, they're looking your heart rate. There are several places I wanted to see in the world. I wanted to see Patagonia in South America and see uh, Machu Picchu in Peru. But this has always been, uh, I think, part of that dream is, uh, is Africa and Kilimanjaro, as well as all the land around it. And of course, we like you to have that dream to be on the top of, of Africa, the highest peak of Africa. We would like to be part of you to make sure, side to side, you're going to get that dream. For us here today, for me and my staff and the farm, this is our dream have come true. And we hope that by the end of the day, your dreams is going to come true. (laughs) 
Simon, constantly on the lookout for new ideas to promote the region, has developed an ecotourism activity, mountain biking around Kilimanjaro. His first two customers, Peter and Tom, are two Americans working for local NGOs. The complete tour of the mountain, more than 200 kilometers, will take about a week of sometimes difficult cycling. But Simon also wants his guests to discover the region and appreciate local traditions and culture. Simon, the son of Washaga peasants, is a man with deep roots in his native land. But he's also a man of his times and always has his cell phone in his hand, no matter where he goes. He's in daily contact with the company he created in Moshi, 40 kilometers from his farm. Several times a week, he goes to his office, which is housed in three recycled containers. With the help of a secretary and an assistant, he plans the schedules for his organization, which can, when there are expeditions on, employ up to 30 people a day, including guides and porters. It took four days for Simon and his teammates to get to the west side of Kilimanjaro. Herds of large animals migrate through this region, which is more sparsely populated and arid than the eastern part. Most often, they're fleeing the droughts on the nearby Kenyan plateaus. The mountain bike trek runs between Kilimanjaro and Mount Meru, the second highest peak in Africa. With the expeditions to the top of Kilimanjaro and his new mountain bike trek, Simon's activity is progressing smoothly. With respect for the surrounding environment and with his own convictions, Simon has succeeded in creating his niche by combining a land of traditions where he grew up and the new challenges of a world that's evolving quickly, very quickly. But perhaps what sums up Simon best of all is the attachment and the deep respect he feels for his mountain. This mountain supplies not only the climate, not only the glaciers, the water, the, the, the good weather around this mountain. And to today, we benefit greatly of this mountain. This is not only the Wachaga people, this is a, a treasure for my country. Since his first climb as a porter at the age of 16, Simon has been working on making his dreams come true, taking his destiny into his own hands. In his own way, he has become a sort of symbol of Africa on the move, open to the curiosity of the world. <laughs> 